we will mainly today we're going to try to talk about how to do the analysis of clinical trials. And if you remember what I said the first day, is that the analysis is really very boring because it's simple. It is if you've done the design properly, if you've conducted the study properly, then there is no problem with confounding. And so the statistics are usually having to deal with potential confounding. So we really don't have to worry about it if we've done a very large study and we've designed it and we've randomized and we do it under intensive retreat. Um, and there is nothing that we have to do. But if we're doing intensive retreat, the analysis of the primary hypothesis is crude and simple. And it is ignoring any problem that we may have had. So we don't adjust for anything. Oops. It only depends on the type of data and your hypothesis. If your hypothesis was a superiority one, superiority, that's how you do your, your hypothesis. The analysis outcome is going to be one or two.
protocol, and that is participants who follow the protocol. So we also have the effect of receiving the treatment. As true, estimates the effect of receiving a treatment to the treatment the actual received, not the treatment of so compliance with it. So they may have disregarded the treatment and they crossed over to something else, for example. So people do that sort of things. The journals and the regulatory agencies only want ITT. So you should always do ITT, but they don't prohibit you from doing the other ones as long as you present them and uh, fully transparent, as Dr. Mahesh said, about what you actually did. As I did this, I did that, I did that, I did that. These are sensitivity analysis. You reserve your p value for the ITT and not for all these other ones, for example. Okay. They're not simple to interpret because you're ignoring the randomization when you do as treated and per protocol. And so selection bias comes in and you have to then deal with it. And there's this good paper here, you cannot read it here, um, in JAMA, interpreting the results differently for intention to treat per protocol and as treated because they are different types of things to interpret in it. So pay attention to that. Today, I'm going to talk more about the analysis. So how do we analyze this? As I said, it's going to depend on the type of variable. And Dr. Jayasilan yesterday told you, talked about binary variables and talked about continuous variables. There's also, I mentioned the time to event variable if you're doing survival type uh, outcome. So you're not looking only whether it occurs or not, or you're not measuring something, you are seeing when does an event occur. So the type of variable that we have are baseline variables and we have follow-up variables. So baseline variables are those things that are collected on a person prior to being randomized. And we consider those as not changing over time, even though they may have been changing over time, but you measure it once and you have it. And they're used to check eligibility and may permit you doing subgroup analysis later. But follow-up variables are those that are important ones. Those are potentially the outcome variable, right? So you have your primary outcome variable is one of those follow-up variables. When we say analyze a trial, it's looking at the primary outcome variable. But there are many other things that you have collected in your study. You've collected secondary outcome variables. You've collected harm variables. You've collected adherence, compliance, how to monitor the participant care. And you have other time variant covariates. You may be taking the blood pressure of the person every time they come. You may be taking their lipids values every time they come. You may be taking their weight. You may be taking something else. You may be asking them about their diet. You may be asking them about their physical activity. Depending on your study, you measure a bunch of other things. Why do you measure these things? If you did a large, simple trial, you would not spend time measuring any of these things. But then you have only one question that you answer. So people like to use the participants in a trial to answer a bunch of questions. But be careful. Don't start measuring so many things that you lose focus on your study. And your study is there to look at one question mainly, and that is the intervention and a primary outcome. Secondary outcomes and harm outcomes are also important, but not all these other things that people decide to measure to, oh, help out my colleague down the hall that wants to do this. So they've asked me to see if I can measure their satisfaction with the healthcare system. What does that have to do with it? And then they have to fill out a 20 page questionnaire and your participants get upset with the, having to do that. And your participants drop out of your study because you're helping out somebody else collecting something else. So be careful and be in so much collecting a lot of things. So types of outcome variables are different. So we talked about the continuous one. And so the analysis is very simple. If you have a continuous one, you're comparing means or you're comparing 
uh, the quantiles like the median or the 95th percentile. Um, in uh, some nutrition studies, they look at percentiles, um, but you're looking at changes of means. So if you remember your basic statistics courses, this was a t-test of independent mean, or if you have a small sample and you don't think that your data are normally distributed, then you do the Mann-Whitney test, for example. Very few people use a categorical one as the outcome, but you may be, we have a, a colleague that is working in irritable bowel syndrome, and the outcome there that they're interested in is amount of pain, self-reported pain. So it's none, mild, moderate, severe. That's a categorical ordinal outcome variable. So what they're trying to see is that these, these are women, the women at baseline are complaining. They usually start off with severe and moderate, and they want to see how many shift down with treatment to lower levels like none or mild. And so you can categorize or make it dichotomize and make it moderate, severe going down to uh, mild or none, or you can keep it as an ordinal. Now you're looking at the frequency distributions of these things. Very few people do this kind of stuff, but some people may. More commonly, the most common thing is a binary outcome. So Dr. J. Seelan talked yesterday about proportions or event rates. So people will talk about at a given time point, you can calculate the relative risk, and that's the risk in one group relative to the risk in the other group. And risk is another word for pro probability, and we estimate the probabilities by proportions. So it's just calculate the proportion in this group that get this event and the proportion in this group that gets the event and take the ratio of that. That's the relative risk. Or you can take the risk difference, or you can calculate the number needed to treat, which is just one over the risk difference, for example. All of those are exactly the same. They're using the same data, the same proportions. And you can do it by Fisher's exact test or chi-square test. Or if you're now doing regression, you're doing logistic regression, okay? Here I should have put multiple linear regression if you're doing regression here. The other type of variable is when you have a binary event, but you're as your clinical endpoint, but your outcome is the time to the occurrence of that clinical endpoint. And so we are looking at the distributions of the times to the occurrence of the event. And now we're calculating the hazard ratio. And I mentioned a little bit about the hazard ratio. This is what uh, the hazard is really what the actuaries do. They call it the force of mortality. Um, and it's a great term, force of mortality. It's how much death is pushing down on you. Um, and it's pushing you down heavily when you have a high hazard. And it's pushing you down softly when you have a low hazard. And so you calculate the hazard uh, rate function in one arm. You calculate the hazard rate function in the other arm. You hope that the rates are proportional throughout time. And so if they are proportional towards time, then you only can have to calculate one hazard rate ratio because that ratio then stays the same across time. And so you may have heard of the log rank test is to look at the um, significance of the hazard rate uh, over time, um, assuming that it is um, constant or, or, or proportional. And the Cox proportional hazards model is modeling then other covariates. So this is it. This is the simple analysis of a clinical trial. That's it, there was nothing else to do. So now we can go home. We finished the analysis. No, because now we have to deal with other complications. So we, Dr. J.S. Seelan did this yesterday, so I'm not gonna go over this, reviewing what statistical hypothesis testing is, is doing. It is the way of proving a hypothesis by doing it the indirect way. We assume something is true and see if there is enough evidence that this proves this. 
And so this is the same thing that happens in the court system almost everywhere in the world, where if somebody is accused of committing a crime, the court system assumes the person is innocent until proven guilty. And so the null hypothesis for us is the innocence. The claim, you're guilty of doing this, you robbed me or you killed that person or you did this, that's the accusation is your hypothesis. This is better than that, or this is not inferior to that. And that's the alternative hypothesis is the claim, okay? So then you observe reality, you get evidence from your data. This is what police would be doing by going and getting evidence about it. And then we verify if the data are compatible with the null hypothesis or not. And I like this term, is it compatible with the null hypothesis? And that means when the police are going out looking for evidence, oh, they find that you have a knife in your house that is similar to what the coroner said was the weapon that was used to kill this person. Yeah, but many people can have the same knife. Ah, but the knife that they find has blood on it, and the blood is the blood type of the person that's dead. That's much more incriminating. That evidence is much more incriminating. So that evidence is less compatible with the null hypothesis of innocence. So we do the same thing. If I say the null hypothesis is there's no difference between intervention and usual care, then if I find my data shows me that there is a lot of difference, that is incompatible with the null hypothesis of no difference. So a larger one than I've observed would be more and more non-compatible with the null hypothesis. And that's what you're looking for. The p-value is the probability that the data are compatible with the null hypothesis, simple as that. So if the null hypothesis is true, is the data compatible with the null hypothesis? And so if that is small, it means that the data are not compatible with the null hypothesis and we should reject it. If that probability is large, then the data is compatible with the null hypothesis. So I don't have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. And we say, we do not reject the null hypothesis. Just the same way as the court system doesn't say, they either declare you guilty or they declare you not guilty. They never say, we declare you innocent. So that means we don't ever accept the null hypothesis. We either reject it or we do not reject it. You see the difference here? It's exactly what the courts do. So this is then, if it's overwhelmingly incompatible, then you say it's significant. And if the evidence is insufficient, the null hypothesis is not rejected because the evidence is more compatible with the null hypothesis. And this was what Fisher suggested, and here's the father of um, modern statistics. This issue of calculating the probability of the compatibility of the evidence with the null hypothesis, which he called the p-value. And he said, if p is greater than 0.1, even all the way up to 0.9, there's certainly no reason to suspect the hypothesis. If it's below 0.02, it is strongly indicated that the hypothesis fails to account for the whole of the facts. So he said, if you have it less than 0.02, that's significant. If it's greater than 10, it's not significant. So people started asking him, what about between 0 0.02 and 0.10? What should I do? He was working in agronomy in agriculture, and he said, make more experiments. This is still, we are in the gray zone here. We don't know. And people pressured him and he said, if you are greater than 0.1, you don't suspect the null hypothesis, and you, he called it not significant. If it's less than 0.02, he said, it is 
incompatible with the null hypothesis. The probability that it's compatible is very, very small. So it's likely that the observed difference is unlikely to be due to chance. So he called it significant. And then this is the gray zone for him between 0.02 and 0.10. And he said, we need more information. We need more experiments. But people said, you know, we don't want to do more experiments. Can you give me a cut point? Can you come up with a cut point? And he actually finally was pressured into this. So in 1923, he said, well, there is a convenient thing we can use, and that's 0 0.05. Convenient, not magical. He didn't say it is a magical real cut point, totally arbitrary. And we don't know if he was having too many gin and tonics when he said it, but he said it is a convenient one. And the reason it was convenient, he, I told you about the four different tables in every, I haven't told you, that if you go and look at any statistics textbook before 1980, in the back of the book, there's four tables. Everyone has those four tables. The distribution of the normal, the T, the chi-squared, and the F, F for Fisher. And they have some probabilities that are given there because to calculate this in 1920s, they had to use computers. And who are the computers? Computers were people in the 1920s. Today, computers are devices. Back then, it was people. People that did calculations were called calculators in the United States. People that did the calculations or computed things in the British English were called computers. And computers were these people. And it would take them months, weeks, days to calculate one number in a distribution because they have to do all this numerical integration, do all this mathematics, arithmetic by hand, take square roots by hand, all these sorts of things to do it. So it takes forever. And so they only tabulated the probability distributions in the extremes of things. So for the um, normal distribution, you have it like this, it's symmetric. So I'm not gonna calculate probabilities here because it would take me years to do it. I'm gonna calculate them in the extremes because I have very little to calculate. Or the chi-square distribution is like that, I'll calculate it here. Or the F distribution is like that, I'll calculate it here. The T is also like the normal. So I'll calculate it in the extremes. So they calculated it for a few probabilities. They had point, yeah, 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.05, 0 0.10. Those, those extreme um, ones. And they say, what is the value that you have above that on the chi-squared with one degree of freedom, 10% probability? What do you have? 5%, 2%, 1%. The same thing for the T distribution, the same thing for the correlation coefficient, the R of Pearson. And they did it also for the normal distribution. And conveniently between 0 0.02 and 0 0.10 is 0 0.05. Oh, well, we have it already. Let's use that. And not only that, that he normally found the bell-shaped distribution that Gauss had invented when he was 17 years old. This little kid, Gauss, invented the Gaussian distribution. He was a German mathematician. And that was what uh, Fisher found normally he saw, so he called it the normal distribution. And conveniently, 95.5% of the distribution is between minus two and plus two. And so 95, exactly 95% is between minus 1.96 and plus 1.96. It's approximately the same. I can use 0.05, I can use 0.05, I can use 0.05, I can use 0.05. So it's convenient, let's use that. And now we have most people that don't think about what this means or don't understand what a p-value is, which is the majority of people. They think that something is important if you get a p-value less than 0.05, and they think it's not important if they get a p-value greater than 0.05. That is completely wrong. 
importance of a result has absolutely nothing to do with the significance of the result. It's unfortunately that with statistical significance is a significance is a word we use regularly, but a p-value or statistically significant result may be totally unimportant, meaningless. If I do a study on 20,000 people, everything is going to be significant. Any stupid little difference is going to be significant. So significance has nothing to do with it. So be careful when you under, are trying to interpret the results of your trial. All right. And it, so he said this was convenient um, in judging whether a deviation ought to be considered significant or not. And then later on in the 1950s, because people were back then were misusing it, he said no person that would ever use the same level of significance for every circumstance and for every different thing. That is a stupid thing to do. Um, and uh, people need to use common sense and use their mind to each particular case in the light of the evidence and the ideas. People don't do that. And he said that in 1950, and here again, now 100 years from when he originally said it, we're still misusing it and misinterpreting it. And that's why, I don't wanna say the word stupid all the time, but the not very well trained uh, edit editors of journals don't understand this. And they think that because their readers also don't understand it. And this is a perpetuating problem, self-perpetuating problem. Okay. Um, this I'm not gonna go through because this is just the analogy that I just talked about with the legal system and why the <clears throat> rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is correct, when there is no difference, we consider that a really bad decision because that's equivalent to saying an innocent person is guilty. And we don't want to put an innocent person in jail or, or kill them or whatever. It's also bad to let a guilty person be declared not guilty. So a guilty person being declared not guilty is bad, but we're willing to tolerate a little bit more probability on this. So here we all we have the probability of making this bad decision. We keep it very low, 0 0.05, 0 0.01. And here we are able to tolerate a little bit more. So we let this be 10%, 20%. That's equivalent to a power of 90% or 80%. And that's where it comes from, right? This way of thinking that's very close to the legal system. So if the null hypothesis is not rejected, you should investigate if it's due to lack of adequate power, investigate if it's due to large variability because you have imprecision or to some biases. But even if your null hypothesis is rejected, you still need to investigate if it's due to biases and investigate if it's due to some residual confounding, which is always likely to be present in small studies. And most people do small studies and small is anything less than 500, for example. And medium is maybe 500 to 2000. Bigger than 5,000 is when you're talking about large studies, okay? Which are very expensive and complex to do, okay? So um, it has been so misused that the American Statistical Association in, um, came out with a statement and they had six principles and you will have these slides so you can look at them, but it said a p-value or statistical significance does not measure the size of an effect or the importance of a result. Please remember this. This is an important thing to remember. Statistical significance has nothing to do with clinical importance. And the reason people, I think, this is my opinion, people that are timid or shy or don't want to say, in my opinion, this is an important result, will use the statistical crutch of significance. 
And that's all it is. They're using it as a crutch because they don't want to say, I think it's important because they don't want to be criticized. But anyway, that's my personal bias. All right, so that's testing. Now let's do the analysis. We saw that it's simple. What are the steps? You've done your study. Now you're going to analyze it. You compare groups at baseline to assess randomization, balance things. That's the famous table one in every trial. Then you assess the process variables. Did I really have a good study? Did I have good compliance? Did I have good adherence? Did I have many people that crossed over? Did I have many withdrawals? Did I have um, these sorts of problems? Um, you want to assure yourself that you have a good study. Then you describe the primary outcome. You do summary statistics, you do graphs, you do all sorts of stuff. And then you do the inferential analysis of the primary outcome, which we talked about yesterday. And that's a crude one. But then you do sensitivity analysis to rule out biases and you put it in context. Okay, let me see what happens in this area. I did my study in Tamil Nadu and Kerala, but oh, did I have things, if I look at it, did I get similar results consistent in both places or there's something different? So you start doing all of these things that are happening. And these are then the descriptive and supportive analysis of secondary outcomes, subgroups, covariate adjusted, all of these, this is regression models. This is doing subgroup analysis. This is looking at secondary outcomes. And these are secondary things that you do. Why do you do them? You do them to explore your result. And that is an important word. It's exploring. And so exploring is not the same as statistical testing. Because statistical testing requires a hypothesis. And I don't have hypothesis for all these other ones. I haven't specified, I haven't planned, I haven't designed the size of the study to address all of these things. And so p-values do not belong in any of these exploratory analysis. You're doing descriptive things, there is no p-values there. Supportive analyses, you can present the confidence intervals, you can interpret this, you can say the results are consistent with the results I got for the primary outcome, or they're not consistent. But those are subjective assessments. Oh, they look like in general, everything is working. It's working for all the secondary ones. It's, it's not causing harm. See the confidence intervals, look at it. Oh yeah, it's consistent in men and women. In the subgroup analysis, it's consistent in the ones that were older and the younger. It's consistent in the Kerala and Tamil Nadu. It's this, or it's not consistent. And you can say, oh, it's not consistent. And now you try to explore why it may not have been consistent. Oh yeah, the people that were doing this here, they were working in small clinics that did not have the resources. Maybe there's more variability there. They got a similar effect, but they didn't get a, a big effect there as we got a big effect here. We did it better here, blah, blah, blah. And all of this blah, 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 should not have p-values. That's the main problem, okay? And this is where it, this analysis is basically now treating this as you do in observational studies. Many people look at this and what you're doing is supporting your primary, but when you put p-values to it, you're basically now saying, oh, I have another hypothesis that I wanted to test on this. And you do what many people do in observational studies where they also have one research question, but they do gazillion analyses and then report the p-values of the ones, of the analysis of the p-values that are significant. And that's the danger here. You should not be doing that here. You should not be doing that either in the other ones. So simple stats. Comparing two groups, what do we compare? Usually we compare the mean if it's continuous, but we could be comparing other aspects of the distribution. 
when we, how do we do it? T-test or the Mann-Whitney test compares the medians or the kolmogorov smirnov compares the entire empirical cumulative distribution function. Many, few people do the non-parametric ones because they have less power than the t-test. Um, in a table or graphically, this is a study of pain and aspirin, or uh, sorry, acetaminophen um, for treatment. And they're comparing um, if they use acupuncture versus placebo and how much uh, aspirin they had to take. And um, they had few patients. They had um, seventy patients here, and sixty-five patients on the placebo arm, and they were comparing acupuncture versus placebo, and they had as um, their primary outcome was their pain score on the visual analog scale. So they're from zero to ten or zero to one hundred. People would mark their pain. And at baseline, it's 49 here, it's 54. There was more pain here at the beginning. And they measured the pain throughout um, the study at different time points. I think this is every month or week, week. Yeah, weeks one through four were treatment weeks. And then they continue measuring it along that. Remember what I said yesterday, when do you measure the primary outcome? You have to state that in your protocol because things may be different. Um, here it is going down and here it is going down as well. Is it going down more in the other? They've plotted it. But if I do my analysis at two weeks or four, let's say I do it at four weeks at the end of treatment, I have some difference. It lasts for a while, but if I had said, I'm going to do it at 12 weeks, the difference is gone. And so do you what? Do what? When do you select it? You have to have thought about the pharmacokinetics uh, of this, pharmacodynamics of when do you think it's going to be more effective, but it's acupuncture. So now you talk to the acupuncture uh, physician and say, when do you, how long does it take for this to work? Um, and they are the specialists, they know. So yeah, you should do this, you know, do four weeks of treatment and you know, by week eight, it should be when you test it. So you measure it along the time, but you test it at a given one. And so they tested it at five weeks. Why? Because that's the biggest one they got. They didn't say it beforehand. You need to say things beforehand. So how do we handle missing data? Many of you were asking me this yesterday. If I have continuous outcome and I like a satisfaction or something, and I have people that miss, the best way to handle it, don't have it missing. Do everything in your power for that person not to disappear. Yes. of the table based the previous table. Oh, the previous table, how do I interpret it? So the way to interpret this is, this is the primary outcome, right? These were secondary outcomes. Who is using pills? So first thing I would do is if this is the primary, I would say, tell me at what time point are you assessing the primary outcome? And they need to have said that in their protocol. So I'll go to the, if they have, this is an old paper, but I should have put the, the reference here, it's somewhere there. Um, but uh, they didn't register their protocol. So then they can cheat and do whatever and then choose whichever one is the best one, right? So no, they registered, they say, I'm going to assess my primary outcome at this time. And then I look at that one. Okay, let's say they said it's at week eight. So it's 16 here and 28 here. And these people started higher and ended up here. So they had small numbers. So they had pretty much ba uh, balancing of the baseline pain was not achieved. So then I would probably look at the change 
from baseline of each person at week eight from baseline, right? And now I have uh, 65 changes from baseline in placebo, six, 70 changes from baseline, from week eight to baseline in the um, acupuncture group, and then do a t-test, simple as that. However, notice what happens. The acupuncture group at week eight, you have 59, you lost 11 people. What do you do with those 11 people that you've lost? You lost two here, then one, then you kept losing them. You have to do something. If you're going to do intention to treat, you better have 70 differences. So now you have the problem of, why well, do a sensitivity analysis or I invent the data, make up the data. We have a very nice fancy term for it. We call it imputation. And people say, oh, let's impute the data. And when I tell them, because it sounds like, oh, you're doing some nice statistical technique. Yes, you're doing a nice statistical technique but you're making up the data. And so be careful if you have to make up a lot of data because you're going to get criticized for it. Intention to treat many people miss, say it and say, we analyze this by intention to treat. Uh, everybody randomized was analyzed. But then they say we had 59 differences here and we had 59 differences in the other one. And they all of a sudden, the 11 that you lost here and the um, uh, 59. So the six that you lost there, what happened? Oh, I didn't have the data. And then it's not intention to treat because they're not included in the analysis. So be careful people with missing data, they still call it intention to treat and it's not. So if it's intention to treat, you better have everybody in the analysis. And if you don't have their measurement, now you've got to do something. And so people do, all right, I'll say everybody that was lost here had a bad one. Everybody that lost there had a good one. So that's one worst case scenario, get the best case scenario, see the difference between worst, best and, and worst. If it's not changing anything, then fine. Uh, but if you have a lot of people missing, it's going to change things. And so then you do that, right? Um, but that's on the primary. And then these are secondary. So you can describe and say, well, you know, here at week eight, um, you know, they started off using the same amount of acetaminophen, uh, and at week eight, it's 1.9 here, and at week eight, it is 1.8. There was no change, no meaningful difference in mean daily acetaminophen. Pay, the percent of, this is the tablet, and the people using was 30% here, and 37% here. And so here is a benefit, right? But again, this is based on 21 out of 59. They should have had 20, oh, it's, it's a 21 out of 70? No, it's 21 out of 59. Because that's why they get 30% or 33%. No, maybe that's out of 70. You have to calculate it based on the 70. Um, and how do you know if the person you had 11 people gone. How do you know if they were using acetaminophen or not? Now I have to make up that data to do that. And this is the problem with missing data. This is one reason why many people don't use a measurement as a primary outcome, because if you lose the people, I have to make it up, or you don't use an observation as one, because if they disappear, what I have to make that up to. So people do time to event analysis, okay? And that's one way everybody has a time and when they get lost, well, they didn't have that event in the time that I was watching. So then I don't have missing data and the one way to handle that, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Sir, but uh, what about the uh, course of events? Because at week eight, it may turn to be significant. But if you look at the overall trend, then yep. it may or may not. Well, be... but you would have specified it at your thing. You can say, my primary outcome variable is the trend over time. That's different than my primary outcome is the difference at week eight. But uh, which is uh, more likely to yield a statistically you, significant? That, no, there's not a question of statistical significance. It's, first of all, which one do you think 
is the most meaningful thing to compare the two interventions? Is it the trend or is it the value at one point? Then you tell me that. And if you say, oh, it's the value at one point, then I ask you at what point? You decide. It's not because, and this is before you do the study. Yes, sir. That's you don't have the data. You don't decide after you see the data. I'm going to test it at this week because I'll get significance, which is what they did, by the way. Yes, sir. I understand, sir. But in statistical point of view, which is more likely to yield a, a positive result? Well, doing a trend analysis or <clears throat> just looking at a particular time point? Um, the there isn't an answer to that that is a real answer. I mean, it, it depends on what you're studying, right? And what the trend is. Because in many times, drugs in particular, um, the, this is not drugs, but um, drugs in particular have a lag in when they start showing an effect. And so you talk to your pharmacoepidemiologists and get the PKP, PD stuff and find out when it is. Also, you have read the literature. Also, there have been phase two studies. You have studied this. Somebody has studied this. And you know from reading that when it should be and which one is the best thing. And it's what is a clinically meaningful uh, outcome as opposed to you don't decide your outcome based on what is the most likely to give me significant result. You base your outcome on what is most likely to be a meaningful outcome to patients or to the medical community or to uh, the uh, government or whoever is doing this. That's how you decide on an outcome, not on which is the most likely to give me significance. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to understand the patients and then they write trending towards the patient. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. They, they use all of these things, trending towards or marginal significance. As, as poorly as significance itself is understood, those are even less well understood terms. These trending towards who, what trending are you talking about? Uh, 0 0.06 is trending, it's not moving. It is there, it's a number that you've calculated. So trending is not a good term. Um, marginal is also not, uh, it's very ambiguous. What is marginal to you may not be marginal to somebody else. Um, and again, it's not, you know, point zero five one is not really different from point zero four nine. So why do people think that point zero four nine is some significant and point zero five one is not significant? That's absolutely garbage way of interpreting things. So you actually look at the number, you make a common sense assessment and say, we did not reach the magical 0.05, but we have an important result. We have a meaningful result, or we don't have an important result, or we have this, or we have that. But that's what I said, people don't like to say that. People have written like they just missed significance and yeah. that this is a substantial result. Yeah, uh, that's are fine. these correct words to yep, substantial is good, large is good, fantastic is good, great is good, not great is also good, awesome is great, uh wonderful result. All of these terms, as long as you feel that they're a good term, that's fine. They're subjective terms, and subjective terms can be used. Um, but then you have to be willing to use them and justify why do you think it's awesome or why do you think it was fantastic result that was not statistically significant? Because now you have to say, we got a great, fantastic result, but we had very small sample size because we did not design the study well, because we didn't get the budget to do it is one thing. Or we got so much variability because we were sloppy in how we did things, or we got biases. So this is not a great result, et cetera. So that's, that's the kind of explanation that people should do. All right, so we talked about continuous. Categorical is usually um, doing frequency distributions. It's not very commonly done, but binary is, is more common. So we have people got remission or did not get remission. People died, did not die. People got a heart attack, did not get a heart attack. People 
guts to be intubated for COVID or do not get intubated for COVID. We have binary outcomes. And so we are comparing the proportions in one with the relative risk. How do we do it? Fisher's exact test or the chi-squared test, they're exactly, um, many people are taught this wrong. Um, they say you only use Fisher's exact test when you have small sample sizes and um, you always use the chi-squared test. But um, if the chi-squared test, the expected value of a cell is 80% of the time, I already forgotten this. This is the thing that they used to teach me back in the stone age of statistics because we didn't have decent computers in 1975. They were just coming out. And Fisher's exact test was taught as um, what you would do when you had, cannot do the chi-square test. And the chi-square test cannot be done when you have small numbers. It should be taught the other way around. Fisher's exact test, the word says exact. You get the exact calculation of the p-value. They should call this the chi-squared approximate test of homogeneity because the chi-squared test of homogeneity gives you an approximate p-value. So would you prefer the exact p-value or would you prefer the approximate p-value? Since all of you love p-values, I'm sure you'd like the exact one. So now they should be teaching it you do the Fisher's exact test by default, unless your computer software doesn't handle it. And the Fisher's exact test is not only for two by two tables, it's for any number of rows and any number of columns. But we were taught you only do it for two by two tables. And I remember the exact homework that we got in my class to calculate the Fisher's exact test with two by two table with 20 observations, it took me two hours to do it. And so that's why they told you the other thing. But nowadays, if you have 400 observations, Fisher's exact test with four columns and three rows may take you maybe 16 seconds on the computer. So there's no problem with doing that. People keep teaching things the wrong way. Hopefully you will understand. Fisher's exact test uses the chi-squared statistic to calculate the exact p-value of the chi-squared statistic. The chi-squared test uses the chi-squared statistic to calculate an approximate p-value of the chi-squared statistic. So which one would you choose? All right. Excuse me? Missing data. Ah. Oh, oh, so I didn't mention this, right. So we do imputations to make up the missing data. And there's, when you make up missing data, you're using data that you have to make up what you don't have. And so if you use something that you have, like for example, I, I'm missing the visual analog score of pain for 11 people. Well, what do I, what could I do? Well, I could take the other 59, calculate their average, and then assign that average to these 11 people in that group. Now, if I look at the, the, the variability of all those 70, they're less variable, right? Because there are 11 of them that are exactly the same. And so what happens then is that if I have less variability, and now I'm looking at the difference between the two groups divided by something smaller. Ah, I get a bigger statistic. I get a bigger effect size and I get significance. And people would do this all the time by doing that. And then people say, no, 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 you can't do that because you are cheating. You're now saying that you have 11 people with the same value. They should have some variability that is not reduced from the normal variability that you should have there. The variance should not be decreased. You need to inflate it and bring it back to what it should be. So thanks to modern fast computers, we don't do a single imputation. We do the imputation multiple times with a little error term in it to recover that variability. So you may have heard people do multiple imputation. 
And that's what it does. So nowadays you can make up the data multiple times. So you don't reduce the variability. That's one way of dealing with it. But again, the best way is to do that. The problem is making up the missing data not only reduces the variability, but you're using data that you have and the data that you have, if it is biased, you're making up data that's biased. And this is what people do not know. So if it's biased, you have what's called missing not at random. The, you're doing a study, um, visual analog score of pain, and the people that have a lot of pain are the ones that quit the study. So now the pains that you have are lower than what they should be. And the people that um, had the higher ones are gone. So you're biasing your mean towards smaller values. So we call that informative missing and or missing not at random or biased. This is the worst thing to have, but maybe it's missing at random. Maybe the reason it's missing is because um, the person um, had to take their child to school and just could not come and get their, come to your clinic and fill out the form. Or they uh, were on holiday or they did something. So it's not based on the value, it's based on something else and so it's random. So it's not so problematic. It is now um, something you can impute. It's not gonna be biased if you're doing the imputation. So people hope that it's at random, but it could be that the people that were missing at random are the ones that went on holiday, right? And who goes on holiday? People that can afford to go on holiday. So it is maybe rich people are the ones that are missing. So it's not based on their pain. So it's at random on the pain, but it is based on something else. So it's not totally at random. It is related to their socioeconomic level. Completely at random is the ideal one, that it's not based on anything else. Not only on the value that's missing, but not based on anything else. And that's what would be the best one. So that the only problem that you have with completely at random is that I have 59 instead of 70, I have less power for my t-test. That's what happens, right? Is that clear? The difference. Okay. You have to do all bunch of secondary analyses looking at, well, who is missing? Why are they missing? Uh, you know, look at the distribution of the people that you have data on. Are there more women? Are there more rich people? Are there more uh, uh, women than men, uh, whatever, young, old? And I do the same thing in the 11. And then I do all of these exploratory looks at it. And you can do all sorts of, you know, spend months looking at it to make sure if you have a lot of variables. Can I check? Oh. Yep. Right. You can do that as well. Yeah. So people do all sorts of sensitivity. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, you can see if the ones that are missing here are similar to the ones that are missing there. And, but more also are the ones that are missing here similar to the ones that I didn't are not missing. Right. The big problem is if there's more than a small percent. And now you'll ask me, what is the acceptable percent? Acceptable percent is zero. The tolerated one is maybe 1%, maybe 2%. Um, if you have a very large number, 1% or 2% may be fine. But if you have a small number, even 2%, may, if you do 20 people, 2%, well, you're not gonna have 2%, you'll have 20% or 10%. Uh, the numbers will be important there. So I have a question here. Like when we are making submissions to the regulatory authorities and suppose it was a global trial and you are submitting to FDA as well as MR. So do they have different criteria of how much missing data is acceptable when they uh, decide on whether the study results are valid enough? You know. So yeah, regulatory agencies will have their own uh, criteria for what they will accept. I don't know what they are, but they all have it. So you can go to their website, check, 
or if you know you're going to submit to the European Union or you're going to submit to the ICMR, write to them. These people will talk to you and they will tell you, no, we don't want this, we want that. We will tolerate, you describe your study and they will say what they will tolerate. People are afraid of contacting the regulatory agencies. They shouldn't be afraid. These people are there, they're government officials working for you. Contact them, talk to them, ask them. They will tell you. All right, so I'm going to have to stop the questions because we have a lot of things to cover and we have to finish this early today because unfortunately my train was canceled and we have to leave early. So I will stop the questions now and we'll continue with this. Let me finish this and then we'll get, we'll get to the questions, but let me finish what I wanted to cover. Um, so in order to avoid the problem of not observing a clinical endpoint because somebody disappeared from my study, then people do what's called time to event analysis or survival analysis. And so what they're doing is they'll have, let's say these are five patients and you are going to follow them once they're um, for about two years and um, maybe at five months, sorry, five months and 12 months, and you got this person at five months and you got this person at 12 months, and then you stop follow up. You got this person, all of a sudden um, here, they got the event, um, they got it before the 12 months. This person, also you follow them up to 12, but this person, oh, sorry, this person disappeared, but this person disappeared then. So what do you do with these people? And what do you do with this one? This person, um, the, your study ended here and you would have measured them there. So now this person, you don't have that, but you have two people that got the event and this people, the person you observed the entire time, this person you observed the entire time, but this one, the, you did not get to observe um, the entire time. So you censor their information when they are dropped out of that. And so um, at 12 months, we have the outcome available on B and D. And if outcome is a measurement, we have to impute. If outcome is an event, we can then study time to the event. And so I'm not gonna give an have an example here, but I'll not take time to do it. We have an outcome variable, then what we observe is the time from when they entered to when the event occurred, because when the event occurs, I stop following, or time until I stopped following that person because they dropped or because the study ended and they did not get whatever I was looking for. Okay, we call that time to censoring or time to event. And what I observe is the smallest of those two, the minimum of those two. Okay. And so, what we have is the theoretical survival curve and the theoretical survival curve is saying, what is the probability that a person survives beyond time T? And we use ST. And at the beginning, we use the term surviving, but it's, you can call it failure. In fact, this is originally called failure distributions, but just the same way as the life insurance people construct death tables and call them life tables. Instead of talking about failure distributions, we talk about survival distributions because that's more appealable to people. And so at the beginning, nobody has failed. So everybody is surviving at the beginning at zero. And eventually, theoretically, everybody fails. Everybody gets it. Now, sometimes people fail rapidly in group B and group A doesn't fail as rapidly. So the hazard rate, lambda, is if you remember your calculus, it's the first derivative, or the, if you remember your geometry, it's the tangent at time point T. This is the what the actuary is called the force of mortality. And here it is stronger force than here. It's rapidly decreasing. Here it's now, this is still decreasing, but this one is not decreasing anymore. And so this is smoother. So if you are, outcome is a bad outcome, you would prefer to be in group A 
because you're not getting the outcome early. You're delaying the outcome. So you want to be in the upper right side of this, okay? So the hazard rate ratio is the ratio of the hazards at the different time points because the hazard, as you can tell, the hazard is changing over time. So it's a hazard rate function of time. But if the ratio of this to this is the same as the ratio of this to this, these are the hazard rate ratio at time point one and the hazard rate ratio at time point T2, time two. If they are the same, then we say the hazard rate ratios are constant or the hazard rate is proportional or the curves are proportional. So proportional hazards comes from that. The ratio of the hazards of the two arms. If it is constant, if they take it at any time point, I get the same number, then I don't have to report it at different time points. I just report one. So if you have proportional hazards, then you have a constant hazard rate ratio. And people unfortunately don't call it hazard rate ratio because it takes three words. They call it the hazard rate, but it's actually the ratio that they're talking about. So you will see HR and they really should have put HRR, but people are lazy and unfortunately we're stuck with that. So why is that important? That's important because I would like to say that group A is better than group B. So their hazard is smaller than this. The hazard rate ratio of this to this is going to be less than one. And just like we were talking about the relative risks, less than one are better. Here, the same thing. Hazard rate ratios that are less than one are better for whatever is in the numerator. Okay, And that's what we call survival analysis. I'm not going to scare you with the formulas, but those of you that like formulas, you have them here. So I'm not going to go into it. And so we can estimate the survival function. Um, that was a theoretical one, but now we can calculate it with Kaplan-Meier's procedure. Kaplan and Meyer are actual, actually actuaries. <laughs> they were working in life insurance companies. And they said, you know, what we use in life insurance companies is what we should be doing in clinical research and censoring people and doing this survival, estimating the survival function when we have people that are censored. And so um, this was a, that study of leukemia. And I would rather be in this group than having be in this group where everybody uh, relapses into leukemia. And this one, people uh, have not relapsed. And I can compare the two curves or I can choose a time point. I, want, I can say in my protocol, I want to know if treatment A or B is better at 12 months at a year. So then I go here and I get the proportion here and the proportion that have not failed here. This is so much better than this. Or I can say the other way, when does 50% of the people benefit in either one? Well, or not benefit. Here, by, I can go then this way. And now this is at eight months, already half of the people have relapsed. Here, I have delayed them about 22 months or so. So I'd rather be in the, in, in the blue one here. So that's how you interpret the Kaplan-Meier curves. You want to have be on the up and right one because you haven't had the bad event. If it's a good event, you want to be, it's the opposite, right? But what most people do is not choose a given time point. They say a long time, no matter at what time, which one is better? So you could do multi, infinite number of cuts, right? Because time is continuous, but the statistic doesn't change all the time. It changes when somebody drops here, when an event occurs. And so I have one change, two changes or differences, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 
11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. There are 17 different differences between them. And they occur whenever one of them fails or not. If I go look at the data, which I had here, did I show you the data? Yeah, this was that study of leukemia. There were 42 people. And these are the times when people fail. If there's a plus is a time when they were censored. This is just to show that. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. 17 different times when things fail. And so I can calculate those 17 differences And I will have 17 two by two tables. At each, I take the 17 time points where there is a drop. And at each one, I calculate a um, two by two table of how many people are still haven't failed in group one and group two. And how many at that time point, given that they haven't failed before, fail in that interval in group one and group two or do not fail. And so I have 17 two by two tables and I can do 17 Fisher's exact tests or I don't wanna do 17, I wanna combine them. And so these two statisticians in the United States, Mantel and Hensel, and two statisticians in uh, the UK, Richard Pito and I think his son came up with the way uh, to combine them and they call it the Mantel Hensel log rank statistic or the Pito Mantel Hensel log rank statistic. Some people call it the Pito Pito, but nobody likes to do Pito Pito. So they just say Pito. So the Pito log rank is the combination of those two by two tables for each of those 17 event times where there's differences. Um, and then there's a generalized Wilcoxon test that is, shows that the log rank test is a non parametric test in general, but those of you that are not statisticians, don't worry about it. What you need to remember is that to compare two Kaplan-Meier curves, the statistic that is used is the log rank statistic, okay? And that's what we're using. So we've talked about t-test, we've talked about relative risk, comparison of proportions, t-test for comparing means, and we've talked about the log rank statistic for comparing survival curves. And so for continuous outcome, we have t-test. For uh, binary, for categorical, we have Fisher's exact. And for time to event, we have log rank. Simple. That's it. We can go home now. No. So which one do I use? Which one do you choose? How would you choose? Depends on your type of variable, right? So depends on the response variable. If it's continuous, I do the t-test, which in large samples behaves like the Z statistic. And, or I could use the Mad Whitney, which again in large samples behaves like the Z statistic. If it's binary, I can do the proportion of events. And that is the um, chi-squared um, statistic is what is used. Um, to calculate the p-value, I can use the Fisher's exact test, or I can use the chi-squared test, but the statistic is the chi-squared statistic. Um, and if time to an event, I'd use the log rank, which is a, also follows a chi-squared with one degree of freedom. And those of you that are statisticians will know that the square root of the chi-squared is the Z statistic. Okay. And so chi-squared with one degree of freedom. So basically, when we talk about this, we're talking about Z statistics all the time, okay? And that's why we say the critical value is 1.96, for example, because no matter what we do, the crude analysis is always going to be a Z statistic in large samples, okay? That's the primary one. That's the simple one. 
Now come the secondary analysis. What do we do in secondary analysis? We do look at it in selected variables. We do subgroup analysis. We do different subsets of the people, selected subsets of the people. Um, we incorporate covariates and regression models or by stratified analysis. And the regression models will depend on the type of variable. So if it's a continuous one, we'll do multiple regression. If it's binary, we'll do logistic regression. If it's count variable, which very rarely we have, it's Poisson regression. And if it's time to event, we do Cox regression, okay? And this is not a class on statistics, so we're not gonna go into how you do all of these regression models, um, but this is where you would go and talk to your statistician to help you with these regression models. Um, but, whoops, sorry. So the word secondary already implies that you just should not, right? But people do. <laughs> That's the problem, right? So you are now, you are doing this secondary analysis mainly to support the result, the primary result. So you really should not be doing it. Everybody does it. Your papers are full of p-values. Um, and uh, we did a study that was not a clinical trial. It was an exploratory one. And um, we submitted the paper and I said, this is exploratory, this is descriptive. And the um, editor um, demanded p-values. And I wrote back to the editor three pages to say why I'm not given p-values. Sorry, not the editor, one of the reviewers demanded that. And I wrote back to the reviewer three pages on this. And um, the reviewer apparently was not happy, checked with the editor and the editor called me um, and said, I like what you're suggesting. We have too many p-values here. Would you write an editorial for my journal on it? So that's there. So it's, it's slow process of trying to educate people of when is it, it was interesting because this is a um, GI um, one. So I called it when to p and when not to pee, so you can look it up. <laughs> but I was going to call it to pee or not to pee, but then Shakespeare would have been upset. All right. So this is the model that we use for um, time to event, the Cox proportional hazards model for that. Um, now come the complications. What are the complications? Depending on my design. If my design was a different design, now my analysis is slightly different. So if I had to do a cluster design, we have to account for the design effect. And yesterday, Dr. Jayasilan mentioned the design effect, right? Um, and so you have to do that in the analysis if you don't have the ICC to be able to calculate it, but now you can calculate it based on your data. He was talking about the planning when I don't have the ICC, but now I've done my analysis, I can calculate it myself or get my statistician to do it. And now you don't have to use something like a 1.5 or two design effect, use the one from your study. It may be smaller than that. And so you have to inflate the variances. And remember when you make the denominator bigger, now whatever difference you have becomes smaller, the effect size becomes smaller and you get wider confidence intervals. And that's problematic because wider confidence intervals now may include zero or one, depending. Um, so the descriptive analysis are the same as we did before, um, but now you have to adjust variances. Um, crude analysis, the same as before, but with adjusted variances. And the adjusted analysis then are with if you're doing regression models, then we have more complex models to deal with when we have cluster designs. So the same thing happens. The, the crude analysis is the basic simple analysis, but you have to adjust for the design effect. That's it. And then if you do the um, other analyses that are secondary analyses that are supportive, like regression models, you have different regression models that 
you may use or you must have to use. What about complex, other complex designs, not the cluster one? What about factorial? What about crossover? We mentioned those the first day. And if it's factorial, that's not really anything much different, but first check for any um, significant difference. Um, first, overall difference um, and or meaningful difference, hopefully significant. If you don't get significance in the overall, the two by two table or whatever, then you really should not go on further. But many people do. Then you check for interaction effect. And if there is interaction effect, then you report the intervention effect stratified by the other level. If no, you can report the intervention effect for each factor separately. And you get two studies for the price of one here. If it's crossover, you check for carryover effects. People call it latent effects. If yes, you have to analyze each period separately. And you don't get the benefit of doubling your sample size or not. If no, you can combine the periods and increase the sample size. So there's a little tweaks you have to do based on the design. So you have to rule out interaction. You have to rule out latent effects if you're doing this. But that's, again, in the crude analysis. 